Well, good Tuesday morning, everyone. I know I'm coming on air here uh, a little over an hour early this morning, but uh, as it got to be 107 degrees yesterday, uh, right in our backyard um, here in Sacramento, and it's going to be a hot one today. Constance and I are out uh, early doing our, our shopping before... Uh, uh, it gets too uh, terribly hot, and I have other things that uh, I have to attend to today at 10 o'clock, so here I am a little bit early coming to you from the first parking lot of my uh, of our Tuesday uh, uh, shopping marathon, and we're at the Sacramento Natural Food uh, Co-op. So... I'm, I don't have a, a big prepared thing today. I wanted to talk about a couple of things. Um, first of all, like many of you, I'm very uh, uh, bewildered, uh, upset, ang anxious, um, thinking about... Um, uh, what I know from history and what was going on in Europe uh, in the late 1920s, 30s, and 40s, and how uh, uh, how people and civilizations can go mad. And uh, I believe I'm seeing a, a similar uh, dynamic going on uh, in the world, uh, but in my own country, uh, especially, and uh, you can uh, describe all sorts of reasons for that. And I am got to remember, I'm a 75 year old, uh, or will be a 75 year old uh, uh, coot. But uh, but anyway, I, I thought first of all before I. Uh, 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 talk about Hypatia or Hypatia of Alexandria just briefly this morning. I wanted to uh, share with you and uh, perform a, a quick, very quick and dirty Yi Ching uh, uh, operation just to share with you and to see if the Yi Ching could give me any advice on how I should be feeling and reacting to all of this. Now, if I was uh, 17 years old again, uh, I might be acting uh, more brashly and militantly and uh, bordering maybe violently. I was a wild and crazy uh, uh, radicalized youth. Uh, but now that I'm 75, I think I'd like to ask the Yi Ching some wise advice on how best for myself and for my world I should be responding to this. Now, I've never made any major decision, any major decision based on any kind of a divination, a tarot divination or anything else. I do them, I consider them. Uh, when I really want to not lie to myself, I throw the Yi Ching and I use the, the Wilhelm, uh, Wilhelm Baines uh, edition for my uh, uh, Yi Ching. But I also uh, interpreted the entire Wilhelm Baines uh, Yi Ching uh, and comments into what I call the terror or the Yi Ching of my low. And uh, I didn't do it as a joke. I, I, I didn't set out to do all 64 hexagrams and all six lines of the of each of those hexagrams. But once I started, I just kept going with it. And it's quick, it's dirty, uh, 
but uh, and I did it after about 30 years of uh, being familiar with uh, uh, regularly consulting the I Ching. But anyway, uh, I've got uh, five dimes in my hand here, it's five American 10 cent pieces, and it's got the God the, uh, Franklin Delano Roosevelt on the front, and uh, it's got uh, that, uh, believe it or not, I think it's called a fasci, which is um, actually where the name fascist uh, comes from, a bundle of, uh, bundle of sticks with an axe, it's a Roman symbol. And I've got one nickel with a God Jefferson. Or is that? Yeah, I think that's Jefferson. Well, anyway, a couple of presidential gods. Now, I'm going to shake these up while I ask my, my question. How should I, how should I most properly and spiritually uh, be reacting to the world events that are swirling around me right now in the early summer of 2022 to best, most wisely react to the situation. That's just what I'm going to do. Now I'm shaking these things and I'm picturing that God is Chinese. He's very thin with a long kind of Ho Chi Minh beard. And he gives me the nod to throw them now. I threw them on the dashboard. Now I'm going to reorder them as I see them. The nickel is on the bottom. Then there is, ah, that's there. Tails, tails, heads, heads, tails. Now I'm going to treat the heads as youngs or unbroken lines, and I'm going to treat the tails as yins. And I'm going to see, look up in my handy dandy Book of Ordinary Oracles where the Yi Ching of Milo appears, and I'm looking up the table in the back there, like that. So let me let me see here. We've got tails, tails, tails. Okay, for the lower trigram, and heads, heads, tails for the top trigram. And so that would be. Hexagram 45 with the moving line in the first place. Hexagram 45, moving line in the first place. How should I be reacting to the, the swirling chaotic world around me? Hexagram 45. Gathering together, massing. The movement has arrived for a mass movement. If it forms around an extraordinary individual, great things will be done. Moving line in the bottom place. The moving lines have a special message. Stop vacillating. You won't be sorry if you supported this guy. Offer your hand. He'll grab it. Now, that moving line changes to its opposite. So it's a tails, and so it would, 
it would turn into a heads and that would give us our little third message. And so that goes from there to there. And let's see here. Hang on, that's tails, tails, that's 45, 45 is there. Okay, so that, so now we're going to go down to, we're going to go down to, there we go, 17. Wow. Following. To prepare to rule, first learn to serve. If you're a true ruler, it'll seem like a rest. Now, you can interpret that any way that, uh, that you want, uh, uh, or not, not interpret it at all, because it's something that I threw. But it's, um, if nothing else, it shows you what you can do in your car in the parking lot with five dimes and a nickel. Anyway, I'm just blown away at uh, kind of what the Supreme Court uh, in the United States here uh, has uh, done to uh, the rights and personhood of the women of this country, very reminiscent of, of uh, the Taliban. And I'm upset that more people aren't upset. <laughs> Okay, <laughs> which is starting to scare me um, because, you know, there's, unlike people of means in Europe in 1930s, there's no America for me to escape to. And, um, well, anyway. Let's don't, let's don't go there. This is a little thing that I uh, uh, wrote for the, the book, uh, Angels, Demons, and Gods in the New Millennium. And it's just sort of an homage to um, uh, Hypatia or Hypatia of uh, Alexandria. And I, I thought I'd share that with you. Constance came up with an idea yesterday. I, I, I said, I'm going to share it with my Facebook friends. She said, no, don't do it. But she's in the store there, and she's not listening. She had an idea that if every woman in this country would just stop wearing pull out their tampons, don't wear any protection whatsoever during their menstruating periods, and just walk around everywhere, just bleeding all over the place. <laughs> and <laughs> It's sort of a sort of a, a a gross form of Lysistrata to remind to remind uh, people what they go through, what you what you uh, what you experience. You know, maybe I'll just uh, 
Oh, she'll be bad. She'll be so mad at me. But anyway, I'm not suggesting that you do that as a, a mass protest, and neither would she. But, but something's got to be done. Uh, something, something more dramatic, and um, or maybe it doesn't. Who knows? Um, anyway, in A.D. fourteen fifteen, Cyril, the Bishop of Alexandria, Egypt, found himself in the most awkward position. Now, Cyril became a saint. We're talking about Saint Cyril. Not only was he burdened with the task of concocting viable doctrines from the muddled and confusing traditions of the young Christian cult. Now, I really mean that. He came up with the, the idea, or he gave voice to the idea of this holy trinity thing that just confused everybody initially and is continuing to confuse everybody now. But I digress. Not only was he burdened with the task of concocting viable doctrines from the muddled and conflicting traditions of the young Christian cult, he was required to do so in the most sophisticated and enlightened pagan city on earth. Long before the alleged virgin birth of the crucified Savior, Alexandria, with her celebrated schools and library, nurtured the greatest minds of the Mediterranean world and Asia. Here, religion and philosophy were lovers, and their union gave rise to a dynamic environment of dialogue and debate. On more than one occasion, Cyril tried to glean converts from the student body of the Neoplatonic Academy, only to be struck dumb by the discomforting realization that the fledgling philosophers were far more knowledgeable than he about the subtleties and shortcomings of his own faith. Uncomfortable as such moments were, his grace bore them dutifully. They afforded him the opportunity to suffer for his faith. His patience came to an end, however, when his faith and reputation were challenged by the brilliant, charismatic luminary of the Alexandrian school of Neoplatonism, Hypatia, the greatest woman initiate in the ancient world. I've said, I've called her Hypatia for years. I'm going to continue. Hypatia of Alexandria was without question the most respected and influential thinker of her day. The daughter of the great mathematician Theon, she took over her father's honored position at the academy and lectured there for many years. She, more than any other individual since Plotinus, the father of Neoplatonism, grasped the, the profound potential of that school of thought. Her lectures were wildly popular and attracted a stream of scholars who saw in Neoplatonism the possibility of a truly universal spiritual order, a supreme philosophy, an enlightened religion to unite all religions. Such was the golden promise of Neoplatonism, and Hypatia of Alexandria was its virgin prophetess. Troubled by the continued degeneration of the Christian movement, and in, in the early 400s, that degeneration was pretty damn degenerate, but I digress. Troubled by the continued degeneration of the Christian movements, its intolerance of other faiths, and its dangerous preoccupation with miracles and wonders, Hypatia began a series of public lectures dealing with the cult, cult of Christianity. 
she revealed the pagan roots of the faith and systematically unmasked the absurdities and superstitions that infected the movement. Then, with power and eloquence surpassing that of any Christian apologist, she elucidated upon what she understood to be the true spiritual treasures found in the purported teachings of the Christ. Her arguments were so persuasive that many new converts to the cult renounced their conversions and became disciples of Hypatia. Her lectures stimulated enormous interest in Christianity, but not the Christianity as it was presented by Cyril, the Bishop of Alexandria. Not blessed with the strength of character necessary to suffer a personal confrontation with Hypatia, Cyril embarked upon a campaign of personal vilification by preaching to his unwashed and fanatical crowd, and I do mean unwashed. In those days, washing was considered a sin of vanity. So the Christians, I'm not just being mean, I'm being literal. Unwashed and fanatical crowd, Cyril was preaching to, he preached that Hypatia was a menace to the face, faith, a sorceress in league with the devil. These diatribes seem to have little effect upon the sophisticated population of urban Alexandria, who were beginning to realize that Bishop Cyril's Christianity was a cult that didn't play well with other children. Deep in the Nitrian desert, however, Cyril's hateful words eventually reached the crude monastery of Peter the Reader. Years of preaching to the wind and converting scorpions had uniquely qualified Peter to be the cleansing sword of the Prince of Peace. And the thought of a devil-possessed woman attacking his savior was more than this man of God could stump. Mustering a ragtag collection of fellow hermits, he marched to Alexandria, where he met with officials of the Caesarean Church, who informed him that each afternoon the shameless Hypatia drove her own chariot from the academy to her home. Armed only with clubs, oyster shells, and the grace of God, Peter and his mob ambushed Hypatia in the street near the academy. Pulling her from her chariot, they dragged her into the Caesarean church, where they stripped her, beat her with clubs, and finally, because of an ongoing debate over the soul's eternal salvation, if the corpse remained whole, they scraped her flesh from her bones with the oyster shells. The scoops of flesh and the rest of her remains were then carried away and burned. The reaction of the Alexandrian community was one of confusion and shock. And the Neoplatonist school was dealt a blow from which it never fully recovered. Although he went to great lengths to distance himself from the incident, Cyril took full advantage of the situation and used the terror of the moment to, to intimidate the city and establish that the will of the Christian God was to be resisted at one's own risk. The martyrdom of Hypatia was certainly not the first example of truth, resisting evil and losing. But it did mark the beginning of a prolonged spiritual delirium tremor from which Western civilization has not fully recovered. 
Even the bright souls who did not succumb to the universal madness were forced to blossom against the, the twisted projections of the collective nightmare. Spiritual growth is not impossible in such an environment. But where wisdom is perceived by the world to be ignorance, where love is considered sin, and all that is best in the human spirit is condemned and repressed, the road by which a seeker of enlightenment must travel takes many curious turns. On such a journey, one's companions are outlaws and rebels. Sacredness breeds in blasphemy. Truth falls from the lips of false prophets. Heaven is sought in hell, and God is the devil himself. Constance is back. I'm going to show them your outfit today, dear. No, I'm not going to show. Here. There she is. Good morning. I'm in a white skirt because I'm a crazy old woman who can't ride her bike shopping anymore, so I dress up like Oleg is doing an English shop. I told them a little bit about your... your women letting it letting it oh fly. my god <laughs> can you can you explain it a little better than i did dear i was quite angry on was that monday so i said it would be great if we had a bloody july and all women because men have no idea that what happens when women have babies or don't want to have babies or have their period so all or anything about women <laughs> at all. So, and, and even women hide it from each other, and nobody tells anybody anything still, even though it's a long time, you know, that's how it was 200 years ago. Um, so maybe we should have a bloody July, and women, I don't know if I could do this because, you know, obviously I can't do that, but I don't know if I would do it if I were able to. Everybody just lets their period leak out on everything for like all of July. And of course, everybody wouldn't be having it at the same time. When you go to work, everything just it just be icky. We're old clothes all, so everybody can see what happens. Men would actually figure out, what, you know, what happens to women. And just, just and anyway, it was a very gross idea. Lon really <laughs> likes it for some reason. I don't know, because he wouldn't have to clean it up. Women would end up cleaning it up anyway, so I think it'd probably be a bad idea. So. <laughs> Well, she said it far better than I, so anyway, until tomorrow, we're going off to another store now. Did you get any treats for us, dear? Uh, I guess I got six whole wheat fig cookies and, the, and, and some jicama. Oh, jicama. Mm -hmm. And yes, I got... <laughs> Mm, it's, a non, it's, a, it's a it's a it's a yes okay it's a non-bread way to eat hummus so well until tomorrow do what thou wilt should be the whole of the law love is the law love under will see you tomorrow <laughs>